get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs like the founders of P90X, Atari, people like Jay Steinfeld. Uh, check out his interview. He started Blinds.com in 96 with $3,000, grew it to $200 million, sold it to Home Depot, but not without overcoming a lot of big challenges. Uh, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Rise25's mission is to connect you to your ideal prospects and referral partners. Uh, We do it in three ways. We help people launch and completely run your podcast, um, get it distributed across 11 or more different channels so you can just show up, talk, and we do everything else. This is probably the single best thing I've done in my business and my life because I've even made great friends out of it. Um, The second is we do live in-person VIP days and receptions all over the country with top entrepreneurs. Third is we do a done-for-you lead generation service where we manage a consistent outreach to your ideal clients and referral sources. This is not paid traffic, by the way. Uh, And Jason will talk about some of those social media channels. Since this requires a lot of humans to do the work, we have limited bandwidth. So if you're interested, go to rise25.com and contact us. This is a long time coming. I'm excited. Today, we have Jason Miles, who's founder of Pixie Fair. Uh, He started a family business with his wife at the time called Liberty Jane at their kitchen table in 2008. And in 2013, they launched Pixie Fair, which has become the world's largest online marketplace in their niche. The site averages 50 to 60,000 transactions a month. They've had over 2 million of their patterns downloaded. Um, People describe Jason's wife, Cinnamon Miles, as the Vera Wang of the 18-inch crowd. We will talk about what that means and what their business is. In 2014, Jason retired from a 20-year career in nonprofit management to work on the business full-time. So if you think you've been doing something for a long time and you can't change, Jason will say you're wrong. They also started So Powerful, which is a nonprofit organization focused on creating purposeful products at a sewing cooperative in Zambia. It's at sopowerful.org. He has several best-selling books published by McGraw-Hill on social media, um, Instagram, YouTube, Pinterest, you name it. Um, He's also one of the most popular e-commerce instructors on Udemy. I think the last time I checked, Jason, there were over 17,000 students you can check out that stuff and everything at winningonshopify.com. Jason, thanks for joining me. Thanks, man. It's great to be here. Take me back to 2008, the kitchen table. What was going on? We needed money really badly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that was a, that's the short version. You what was the conversation? Well, yeah. Oh, totally. yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, we basic. Well, so the setup for the for our entrepreneurship is, I, you know, I had a fun nonprofit career. I've we'd basically been doing nonprofit management work for 20 years. 30 years now. Yeah. 30 yeah years. And, and now because our own charity for 30. Totally. So um, it's been my whole life, but we needed money. Um, 2008. We had basically, I, I had been asked to go down to Silicon Valley and be the area director for a charity and I, it, that I worked for. I mean, so it was just like a internal move, you know, uh, staffing wise, but obviously it was a family move from Seattle to Silicon Valley. And um, I said no for about a year, and then my boss kind of kept pestering me. So finally, I said yes. We moved down in 2005, right at the house housing market bubble, and we used a new product called a Negam loan. No one had ever heard of it, and uh, we were complete idiots, to be honest. And we, you know, we thought we could use that product for a year or two, and refinance. And by the 2007 time period, we were we were screwed. I mean, we were just, it was, we were literally in like, you know, we had our little kids, we were in school, we were in this community. We weren't trying to be crazy. We weren't even living in a nice area. It wasn't even, we weren't trying to be like, you know, Joe real estate tycoon or anything. We were just trying to do what we thought was the right thing in our life and got totally skewered. And it was our own fault, but we desperately needed money. And so 2007, um, 
I had, I had tried everything in my mind to be an entrepreneur before that. Hmm. What have you tried? What were you, what were you well, trying? Well, just, you know, like I would, I would come up with these stupid ideas that I thought maybe there's, maybe there's an opportunity here. You know, yeah. I asked because, one. you know, you, you know, you hear of angry birds or whatever. And that yeah. was, I forgot whatever. They're like thousands game that they actually developed. Yeah. You don't hear about the 900 that went right. bust. Right. So anyways, yeah. you're going to say funny. No, I was. Yeah, I mean, the, the stupidest one that I always remember is inflatable camping furniture. I had the idea for it, like, before it came out. And then it actually came out after that. And I was like, why, Dang it, why inflatable missed, camping furniture? Because we were camping and I was uncomfortable and thought inflatable camping furniture would be good. But I would do these things in my mind where I had these entrepreneurial visions, but no traction. Like, never got to yeah. implementation. Yeah, so what else? So, you had so, so inflatable... Uh, Oh, camping, all, ki- what else? all kinds of different ideas related to the, the the kernel in my mind that initially got me going was I heard about a guy who was making a thousand dollars a day. This was in 1998 and he was uh, doing and, and I talked to him. He needed somebody to help him a little bit part time and I didn't end up working with him. But the idea he had was to set up a traffic school on a website. And this was this is 1998. I mean, it's forever ago. And he went to the county. What was around? It was what AOL was and AOL. Prodigy, and right. like email was still like a set of numbers <laughs> at att.global.net or whatever, you know. So his thing was, uh, he went to the Sonoma County Courthouse and asked the traffic judge if he built a website, could he? Would the judge refer people to it? So, so anyway, I met this guy, and I, that got me thinking, like, oh man, I need something like that. But it, they were just piddly ideas, you know. And so anyway, we were urgently needing money in 2008, ten full years later. And my wife, um, we got our daughters um, these dolls for Christmas, American Girl doll, and we didn't know it's about crazy it. Chicago. The store. Have you been to the store in Chicago? Yeah. Yes, we we've it's, been to all the stores. It's oh insane. Oh my gosh! Now you have daughters, right? So you. Oh yeah, you're, we've you been are, there multiple occasions. I yeah. see you and your family are in my target audience. You 100%. are ideal. You're a hot prospect. So um, my wife was making these clothes for because she she didn't we didn't want to pay for these forty dollars. I've already referred a bunch of people to your website. There you go. Sure. See, yeah, I mean, it's, totally. it's it's amazing. So, but she, my wife, as it happens, is insanely good at making doll clothes and her, she her mom worked for a designer in LA and so my wife her name's cinnamon she grew up learning to sew at a low you might call a professional level because her mom worked for you know just she was it's a like you know if you're LeBron James's son yeah, you're probably gonna yeah. learn to play basketball yeah I like that yeah so um so Cinnamon could just knock this stuff out. So all these moms started saying, where did you get that? Where where, where did you – then the brownie uniform matches goes, my daughter's uniforms. And goes so viral. Cinnamon was like, I just yeah. made it. I just made it. I can show you how to make it. And everybody was like, I don't know how to sew. So then finally um, she started making this stuff and selling it. We started on eBay. And I was – you know, my – career was marketing for nonprofits and fundraising. So it wasn't as if I didn't know some of this stuff. It was just always in a nonprofit context. So I was her hype man. I was her marketing guy and I would help set up the auctions and work on the branding. Mm-hmm. And we got this. What to year? Where her this was 2009. Eight. This, eight. Was eight. this 2000, 2008 still. Okay. Yeah. This is the winter of 2007 and starting 2008. And we would get her auctions. They would go every uh, Sunday night. We'd end them. And her stuff was going for two, three, four hundred dollars wow. for out for clothing. And that's when this is for said, doll clothing, though. Yes. Yes. yes, yes. yes. And Vera Wang, in case you're not familiar, is a design, a high end designer of wedding dresses and clothing and that kind of thing. She's a very famous designer. And so I had written this is sort of subliminal messaging. I had written in Cinnamon's bio. My dream is to be the Vera Wang of 18 inch doll clothes. So then she started having these customers comment online, Cinnamon, you are the Vera Wang of 18-inch doll clothes. So we kind of seeded the thought, you know, and then totally. they took it away. So, and, so it took off, but it was um, super fun, and we made 1000 bucks a month, which was our goal, but it was completely not scalable. How long would it take to make an outfit, for instance? Um, so her, for her to come up with the concept and then make it, it could literally be like, you know, five to 20 hours. Mm. But then the second time she could make it, she could make it faster. So we started selling like eight of eight, you know, eight 
um, copies of, of one outfit or whatever. And, and that, um, so there were semi, um, you know, one off close to, you know, that, and that helped, but she was still so until midnight, she was burned out. She kind of liked the, the, the idea. And we had these people who were fanatical followers. We used YouTube originally and did con- contests to get a following and, uh, but she was burned out. So that lasted for about 18 months. And then we hit a real uh, burnout mode, which we can talk about if you. Yeah, go on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that was the summer of two thousand. So at this point, it's still called Liberty Jane. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so we were. She was basically uh, burned out. And so we just re that summer. We said, look, let's re envision what happened. We ultimately lost our house down in the Bay Area. Hmm. We I ultimately took a job back up in Seattle uh, with the charity that I worked for. And so that was sort of like a life deflating, like crater. Um, And it was so, you know, it was it was uh, gut wrenching. And, uh, you know, like those are the points in your life where you feel like a total failure. When my kids were I remember I'll never forget my daughter. We were staying in the kitchen of our house down in California. And I told when we told our kids we were going to move back to Seattle, Mm. my daughter was I think eight and a half or so at the time grabbed me around my waist and cry like sobbing these mm. big sobbing, t- crying Ugh. tears and said dad you said we'd never have to move again and you're like was, just when you thought it couldn't get any more painful yeah. that was brutal yeah I was, I was it was just like i'm such a loser and uh so then on top but you of guys it, at the time you're having traction with this with yeah, these, we were, these. but it was like a baby, little baby idea that wasn't big enough to rescue our big mess, you know? Yeah. It's like, it, it was a good idea, but it wasn't powerful financially. And so, um, so we moved back to Seattle and that alleviated the need for our thousand bucks a month. But, um, but we had something there, you know? Mm, totally. And I always wanted to be an entrepreneur anyway, a little bit. And she, and she had these followers, but she didn't have the pressure of, making money. And so we, that summer, 2009, we just re-envisioned like, Hey, what could this look like if we redid it in a better way? And we got the idea of, um, selling her designs as PDF downloadable files, uh, sewing patterns. And the nice part about doll size clothing is that it is small. So it would fit like on an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. So you could sell a PDF, people just print it out and they could use it as a pattern. Mm. And as it happens, you know, for most guys who aren't familiar, although you have daughters, so you know the space I'm talking about. But for most guys who aren't familiar with sewing, it's basically the same as guys who are into duck hunting or NASCAR it's, or their muscle I car. I mean, the it's, people it's are rabid. Pattern. It's insane. People, bo- yeah. I mean, are in yeah. sewing box clubs. They're in, you yeah. know, everything. I had a g- actually – I'm trying to think of the guy. Uh, Travis Romine came on and talked, and he had a. You guys should talk at some point. Um, a company where it was doing, I forgot what it was, like ten thousand dollars a day or something in just these sewing boxes. So yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. It's a it's a real niche. I mean, it's a big space. And once you learn what ladies love, they love to hoard fabric and they love to hoard patterns. And so we hit on one of those, which was patterns. And so my wife, the first month, September 2009, we she put out like we put out four, and I think two of them were free, just to build our newsletter list, and then two of them were paid. And I think we sold 11 copies, but we had like 300 people sign up for the freebies. So it was like, okay, that's way better than eBay. And so we it just it's literally skyrocketed. So um, what's at the time? The, so what's included in that? And then now has it changed on what's included yeah, yeah. now? Yeah. So originally it was our own site. We hobbled together this little garbage site. We used the site for photographers, some some platform for top photographers. But anyway, so we made a website and um, they would get a PDF download of the item. And there was, so we used like a magazine style cover. You can go look to see what these look yeah. like at pixiefair.com. Yeah. But um so at the time it was just her designs and uh, we we started selling them and we hobbled together a shopping cart. We used, I forget even what it was called, some shopping cart that was ridiculous. And um, so then we got onto WordPress, which was literally four years of a pain. And um, but we it started really growing. I mean, we started getting real sales and, t- and traction. And by six months, it was way, way 
exceeding what we had ever done on the eBay side of things. And so we just started crushing it because it was fun for her and it was easy. And then other designers came to us and said, hey, would you sell my designs? Mm. And that was sort of the seeds of the bigger idea, the new yeah. idea. And so we got to the point where we were selling Cinnamon's brand, which was Liberty Jane, and about 20 other designers. Got it. By about 2013. And um, and I was working full time still. And I was like, you know, I'm, I got my career. I'm happy, but I'm the nighttime marketer and evenings and weekends marketer. And so but then we thought, you know what, we need to maybe scale this bigger. We heard about Shopify and um, really had explored what platform would work best. Because, you know, with WordPress, especially with hosting companies, it's like you can cook up a fantastic Black Friday or Cyber Monday sales strategy. And if literally at 12.05 at night your website crashes and you're asleep, you're screwed. Yeah. It's like it's, it's over. And so Shopify was just literally like I'm the ultimate Shopify fanboy. And totally. we can talk about how we got into that. But we loved it. It worked. We launched it as Pixie Fair. So it was sort of a marketplace idea mm -hmm. where we're basically like sort of Etsy and Craftsy, sort of our competition in a way. Um but um, these designers just started signing up to sell through us. It's a royalty deal for them. They get paid ro on royalty, you know, That's after great. we make a sale. That's great. And um, and it's scaled. So we've had now over well over 2.5 million patterns downloaded through the site. We'll do 60 to 70 thousand transactions a month. It's a freemium model, so a lot of those flow through is free, but obviously a lot of them are paid. And then on that site, we basically built several other things: online courses. So we have, um, you know, four or five great courses that are all sewing related. Like if they want to learn to actually do it, and they yeah, maybe design. aren't as proficient. They can, yeah, they can do exactly. that. Exactly. And, and oh, I, I guess I, I'm, I said, I said three, three or four. We had three or four core courses. Now this last year, we I think Cinnamon's published like fifteen that are smaller courses. So we have a growing collection of online video courses, and then we launched a membership program called Sewing with Cinnamon. Yeah, it's I really see that. Our newest How does that work? Ship. It says it's join the SWC membership. club, SWC yeah. member yeah. access. Yeah, it's a monthly recurring membership program. They get some goodies and free pattern, and they, you know, it's fourteen bucks a month. And um, so we got over a thousand people in that, and these things have just stacked up, and 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 uh, so that's sort of been our journey. And we've I retired from the nine to five in two thousand and. 14 January 1st and um, now I've really spent a lot more time on writing and speaking and one-on-one -on -one coaching I love coaching and and uh, doing Jason, course. At the time like, is that a tough decision to make yeah it was hard I was senior VP of marketing fundraising and human resources for a university up in Seattle called Northwest University so my career had I I you know I started entry-level admin job and 20 years later I was senior VP and um, at a university, a private university, one of the golden handcuffs is your children get free education. I would and never it's not leave. just at the no. university. It's at a hundred other member mm -hmm. universities in the system that they're part of. And so, and my kids were junior high and early high school. So, and now they're all in college, by the way. So all I actually pay for right now in our whole life is cars, computers, and college. But anyway, so, but yeah, it was hard, to, hard decision. Um, but my commute was brutal. And, um, you know, it just, it felt like the right time to make mm -hmm. a life change. And I feel we like had it's our hard to make a leap like too. that too, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it, it was, but I was kind of ready for it. So I told my boss a year ahead of time, this is what I want to do. He was super cool about it. I still teach there one class uh, a year. Uh, I teach online marketing. Um, and so that's fun. So I'm still connected. My son goes to that university now. He does not get free tuition. <laughs> I pay. Uh, but it's fun. And, you know, so that was my alma mater. I had gone, gone to school there basically myself a long time ago. So, yeah, it was a very hard decision. The, when, right now, if someone buys something on the site, it's a pattern. Does, do any of the products include the actual... Um, fabric or what's recommended you know, for, for no, that? No, no. I mean, the answer is we have literally, I think, three SKUs on the site that are physical mm -hmm. product. We went through a period of about two years where we sold uh, what we call pixie packs, which was cut fabric, zippers, buttons, yes. uh, Velcro, stuff like that. 
And um, what we realized was digital goods is kind of like living your life on heroin or speed <laughs> or crack. And then if we try that, right? <laughs> it, don't try any of those, please right. don't. But um, but that's what digital goods. You feels get like. hooked on it, and it's just over. You don't want to. Yeah. You don't mess with physical goods. Yeah. Yeah. I and figured you had tried it. It's like an anchor, man. It's like it feels like you're dragging yeah. an anchor, a boat anchor around. So yeah. That's our, so yeah. the the evolution of the products, you're sewing them, you're selling them, then you maybe have these packs, but the pattern, and then it's pattern, and now digital pattern. Now it's a marketplace for other people to yeah. have their own patterns. This is great. Um, what was the evolution of the team? Because it started you and your wife, right? Yep, yep, yep. We got insanely lucky. It was a, we were blessed. Um, our first employee, Cinnamon's work is is uh, mesmerizing. Um, she's really good at photography, and when she creates something new, it it stands out. I mean, it's so our first sort of kernel of a team member, an idea, was a, a fashion industry professor from Seattle Pacific really? University reached out to us and said, I love your work so much and I'd love to meet for coffee. And we're like, what in the world? So we meet this lady for coffee and she said, yes, I used to work at Abercrombie & Fitch as a designer and now I am in charge of fashion merchandising at the university. And um, she said, I think you need to meet my friend, Karen. Karen is a longtime designer at Nordstrom uh, here in Seattle a senior designer and she retired a year ago from Nordstrom but she's looking for something to do hmm. and we were I was it was like this, such a weird journey I was like why are we meeting with these people but they're so cool and interesting I mean who doesn't want to meet with somebody who used to be a designer for Abercrombie or somebody who's you know a designer at Nordstrom I mean it's kind of interesting so we met with Karen and she just was insanely in love with Cinnamon's design work and what she said was Cinnamon is basically like a um um, a designer who has raw talent that has done it without classical training. And what Karen represented was industry expertise from Nordstrom perspective, which is, you know, the top shelf of, you know, design uh, process. So she was so in love with Cinnamon's work and she had quit Nordstrom a year earlier because she had health issues and a bad boss situation. And so we're sitting there at this at Starbucks and I'm thinking to myself this lady wants to work for us but like we don't have any employees like we're just us and but she was so glowing about it and so um, you know I had an HR background so I could kind of tell when somebody was you know wanting a job and stuff and so she just um, you know kind of made it obvious that she'd love to partner and work with us so I just put it out there and said Karen if we if there's ever a way we could make you a deal that would be acceptable to you? Would, would you ever consider working for us, you know, part-time or full-time? And she said, absolutely. So we circled back, we hammered out a deal, and our first employee was a senior designer, 13 hmm. years experience from Nordstrom. And her and Cinnamon basically went on a five-year run that was industry-changing. I mean, it's not its not an over, like, I am I am the marketer, but I'm not over-hyping it by saying they changed the industry for this funny little niche within a niche of doll publishing, doll clothes publishing and for seamstresses. When she and came they, on, what did she do? So what basically cinnamon? her and cinnamon are basically like, uh, like they can, they, it's hilarious. First of all, to sit to, to have sat, sat with them in a mall, like, you know, the, the big bell square mall here in Seattle is like Nordstrom. It's the anchor store. And you know, there's a lot of coffee shops and stuff. So you sit there, and Karen would be like, hey, that lady's sweater, I designed that. Mm. <laughs> you know, it was like, so it was just funny. And so basically her and Cinnamon would go, could go into any store or see any picture of any clothing and say, let's make that for a uh, doll mm. size. Just getting inspiration. So, yeah. So the inspiration, them. so Cinnamon basically would say, and so she, she went on these epic runs where it was like, hey, Harajuku style, that's Japanese street fashion. Let's do a whole run of uh, Harajuku style stuff. And then she, you know, she, so she would go into these different aspects, uh, red carpet runway dresses. And so they would just see one. Oh, yeah, they got that on full lockdown. They could make that for a doll sized. And then they'd make these patterns that people were like, what in the world? This is exactly like real stuff. Yeah. Because it was. 
And so that and so they would partner on it together and they would make the shapes of the pattern pieces, of course, but then the instructional steps to put it together. And it's not I mean, it's there's some obvious skill and yeah. talent there to put it all together. And they would do it at a professional level. And Cinnamon learned a ton from her. Karen learned a ton from Cinnamon. And it was a great combo for five years. And then uh, Karen went on to work um, for Tommy Bahama. Now she's a senior designer for Tommy Bahama. So she she had a good run with us, but it, it ended. And yeah, I want to talk more about the team because you guys have built it out. But what's interesting, yeah. what I love what you guys have done is, you know, it's a marketplace now. And so it really the community can contribute. Um, I'm curious, has anyone taken it, actually done what your wife did originally, sold them and selling them as, as far as that goes? Well, Dior itself, you know, the famous design company, Dior, does a whole process called um, fashion in miniature. That's mm-hmm. a famous, like, it's like art gallery level. They, they set it up as a art, like, exhibit. And so, and those videos have gone crazy viral of the Dior um, couture, um, the, 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 the shop that version. you work in, in, in a fashion, uh, context like that is called an atelier. So the, the shop that they work in, the videos from their work, people just geek out over. And so, so Dior did it, but, and other people basically have used, um, there's been a whole industry actually of like eight, you know, 15 to 20 year old girls who ladies, you know, young ladies who have basically created stop motion movies with the clothing that my Mm. wife has made and, and other people make from her work. And if the, they're, I mean, they've blown up huge. Mm. So, but no one's exactly done, um, just the straight pure design. I mean, not Um, even the design, but actually just taking the design, making it and selling it. Yeah, the, yeah, and the challenge is, or? yeah, I mean, the, there are there are a couple of people who do it not with contemporary design. What they the only thing that like what you're describing is um, there's one lady who does historical gowns, and she'll sell hers for fifteen hundred to twenty five hundred dollars in that range. With and, the, but, the smaller version for the doll, yeah, doll size, doll size, yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's amazing. But you know that I mean that's hand work and it takes a month or something like that to make it. So you know, fifteen hundred bucks is there's not really a lot of money there. So the question is, what's your you know monetization strategy beyond right. that? That's yeah. why a company like Dior can do it because it's sort of a it's sort of a PR influencer strategy for mm-hmm. them and you know social strategy for them, and then obviously they sell their you know brands. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, what other team members have been have allowed you to get to where you are now? Yeah. I mean, I think we've we've brought in social media person, customer support person. That we have a hundred designers on the site now that mm-hmm. are you know publishing with us. So there's somebody who does that uh, exclusively, just partners with them, gets them onboarded, and all that. Um, and then it's you know a, a bunch of contractors and. You know, mm-hmm. um, you know the typical photography and uh, and our photographer that we work with that she's a contractor for us, but we're her primary client. She was featured in the New York Times yesterday. Wow! Um, that movie Marwin. I don't know if you've seen that. I haven't yet. No. Uh, the movie Marwin um, is, uh, of course, I'm not going to remember is uh, Steve Carell. Steve Carell. Yeah. He's in that movie, and mm. it's a you know a, a Hollywood blockbuster movie. It's all about this guy who um, gets injured in a like a street fight or something, and he was a famous illustrator. And he turns because he's m- mentally impaired, he creates a whole universe verse with dolls, and he shoots them you know photography wise, and and his movie is like a real life version of actually what some people do like Sydney, our photographer who goes, she'll go on New York in New York, you know, on the street and put dolls on the sidewalk and take photos. So, you know, is that, so she, anyway, she was mentioned yesterday mm. in the New York times. And so that's kind of fun stuff like that. So we have people who, you know, we've tried to, and I'm not saying we've done it well, but we strive to find people who are exceptional. And, uh, honestly, we're, mm. that's, you might think we do that well. I feel like it's one of our weakest areas and we want to do it better. But that, the truth is somewhere in the middle. You know what I mean? So. Um, I want to get to talking about, 
you know, winning on Shopify.com and yeah. to kind of bridge that from what you're doing with Pixie Fair to that, um, you know, we talked about the evolution of the team a little bit, the product a little bit. Talk about the infrastructure. You went from, you know, some shopping cart to WordPress, then to Shopify. Yeah. What other tools and software do you use to run the, the business? And then I'd love to talk about because you have 17,000 students on yeah. the Shopify end of things. So, yeah, well, you know, I mean, I would consider us a digital publisher. Yeah. And so all the tools related to digital publishing are tools that we would typically use. I mean, we have people who do uh, their work in InDesign or Illustrator. And, you know, we use photo editing tools and Photoshop elements and all of those types of tools. iMovie and depending on who we use for video work, they use their own video editing um, tools. But so, you know, those types of tools, obviously, for team coordination stuff, we use Slack. Doesn't everybody use Slack? <laughs> um, and... But beyond that, it's not really – there's no magic. There's not a lot of secret sauce. Our social media person used Hootsuite. Um, so th there aren't any big, huge tools, um, you know, QuickBooks and and GoDaddy bookkeeping. Or What do you use for email? Uh, MailChimp. MailChimp. We were on constant contact for a long time. And then Shopify really prefers MailChimp mm. for integration purposes. And so uh, after a year or so of trying to – fudge things together we decided to just convert to mailchimp and we've been very happy with them uh so we have about one hundred and thirty thousand names on our list now um and so you know we're not huge by a lot of people's standards that's not big but by a lot of people's standards it is but yeah we're happy with mailchimp so shopify yeah so what happened was um in 2014 so so you weren't busy so enough so you wanted to create this whole other business no, it was. T I'm a total reluctant <laughs> hero, for real. So I, I was dragged into this shenanigan. Um, what happened was, uh, uh, to to deliver our products in Shopify, we use an app that's called Sendal, and it's a digital delivery app. And so we're we're pretty much like their biggest client. And but they wrote an article about us on the Shopify blog, and so the Shopify blog had this article come out about us. It was an interview with me. I mean, it was just like this. It was like 10 questions though. And so, um, it was, and it was entitled and it came out in 2014. It was entitled how one couple is making $600,000 a year selling digital goods on Shopify. And what happened was Shopify was getting super hot and they had that article installed in their marketing funnel, you know, for new, new onboarding. So that article, and they rank their articles. So their article was at the top, mm. that article, for years, until like last year. Um, it was one of the top articles. And so I would always sort of, every two months, I would check the comments. Like, oh, what are people saying? And, you know, a lot of it was like, BS. No one can make, there's no money in digital products. Like, you know, stuff like that. And I would be like, hi, it's Jason. Here's what we do. And I was always trying to just be kind of defending myself, but kind of, and I realized the title of the headline could have been how one company has sales of $600,000, not how one couple is making 600000 But I didn't write the title. So I would always say that's our top line revenue, you know, blah, blah, blah. But um, finally, I was like, you know what? Screw it, man. I should just make my own course on Shopify <laughs> rather than constantly promoting that, you know, helping them with their you know, answering questions. So uh, Udemy was coming up. So I partnered with somebody else. I made a course on uh, Shopify. And at, at the time, Udemy was kind of becoming a thing. This is like three years ago now. And that course installed itself as the best course on Udemy for e-commerce. And so I've, I've spent a ton of time in the last three years helping students. And, you know, you buy that course when it's on sale for 10 bucks. So it's not like it's a you know, I'm not trying to it's a steal. be crazy or anything. Yeah. And yeah. so I answer questions all the time. Every day I'm answering questions. And um, it just grown from there. So that turned into my own one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching. I built a funnel around it, basically. One-on-one -on -one coaching. I have a membership program. And I have a good time with it. It's fun. So And people can check all that out. That's on winningonshopify.com. Yeah, you that, can just see they links can, to all that stuff. Okay. Yep. Um, yep. And... You, yeah, I mean, there's a, a lot of research I did, which you've you talk a lot about social media, so I want to get into that. But for Shopify aspects, yeah. 
Um, what are some big mistakes that people make um, yeah. on Shopify or not using components of some the e-commerce platform? Yeah, biggest mistake is so Shopify is a fantastic enabler of a good business, but you know the biggest mistake is a lot of the students I hear is like, oh, I want to do a print-on-demand T-shirt business on Shopify. I'm like, well, you're not going to make any money. Like, you better have a better plan than that. Mm. Or like, oh, I got, I've got a product I like on Alibaba. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do Shopify. Or oh, I'm gonna do drop shipping on Shopify. Well, all of those are horrible business models. <laughs> so step one, get, you know, and I, it's brutal sometimes. So sometimes I mean, these people are so emotionally invested in these bad ideas, and I have to talk them down from the ledge. And you know, a lot of times, that's it's sort of my job to say, hey, you know, here's the margin on a pro, a business model like that. And so then it's like they'll either take that or they won't. And if they take it, then I brainstorm with them how they could get better product ideas and, and business ideas. Um, but if they're stuck in their ways, then I'll say, good luck. You know, feel free to take my course. But it's, you know, you'll have a Shopify site. You won't have a business. Um, and so that's really like the biggest challenge. And, and I feel their pain because remember in my own story for 10 long years – I had yeah. my own ridiculous to, shenanigans. To I was try trying a bunch to, of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so it's hard to find a good business model. And so Shopify is not a panacea. I mean, it won't solve bad a bad business model. And it, regardless of what you hear about the hey, I made a million dollars drop shipping in the last twelve months using Shopify. I mean, it's just you. You know, that's like saying having a million people go onto a basketball court and shoot. 10 shots from half court and one person hits all 10 and they're the one who writes the course about hitting all 10 shots. You know, it's like, that's not a bit, that's not, no one, no rational person would say that those are good business models after you look into it. It just won't work for most people. And so anyway, long answer. What do you find does work? What are some of the maybe successful students? What have they been doing? They always have um, a tribe or following that they have basically figured out how to serve with a unique product. Hmm. And so, and, and I, we have tons of students now in our one-on-one coaching and in our membership program that have cracked the code and they all crack the code in a different way, but it kind of all has the same basic concept, which Hmm. is go into a niche within a niche, get real small and get real focused on something you can really geek out over. Don't tell me you're trying to sell, you know, t-shirts i mean you know it's got to be something very niche specific right i mean one of the guys who um in our community that's a one of the biggest sellers in our community um is all chess playing boards and games and training um another person is monarch butterflies and you're like how is what that do they do with monarch he, butterflies he, he created a whole movement called raise the migration for saving monarch butterflies and um he sells cages and T-shirts and signs for your yard. Hmm. And it's hardcore. He, he's like the world's leader, like e-commerce person for monarch butterflies because he's and he's passionate about it. Uh, another person's all about catfish, catfishing or fishing. Um, you know, so yeah. and I could go on and on. But yeah, go so go on a little bit. I love hearing these ideas. I think it oh, will sure. spark someone. Yeah. What are some yeah. other unique products or yeah? Sure. Um, uh, hand tools for... We're going to go workers. through all 17,000 right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stop at some point. Um, hand tools for word workers is another person in our community that's just totally destroying it. For what? Um, What's word, and word workers? So, and that? that's not... Pardon? What, what is it? Word workers? Hand tools and power tools. Oh, got it. For woodworkers. For woodworkers, got it. Yeah, for people who, you know, for guys who are out there building stuff. Um, uh Personal care products, like um, you know, somebody we worked with in the past um, created a, a pumice stone for your feet that is got soap in it, and it was and it's all about caring for your feet. Um, just it, it, you know, you just have to think to yourself: the world has eight billion people, and most of them are online, and many more are coming online. And so, you know, it's the classic thing that it's. It's Chris Anderson's book, The Long Tail. If, you, if you're new to this whole game and you want to figure out how to find a niche within a niche and go about what is referred to as the long tail uh, product strategies, go get that book, Chris Anderson's uh, The Long Tail. And, and it was written 
10, 12 years ago, and it's still so prescient. I mean, it's just the right way to look at it. And so that's what you want to do is go into a niche that you can be passionate about. You can find people that are paying money for their hobby, niche, craft, you know, thing, Mm. and figure out how to attract them to yourself and your product and be real, be authentic. Don't try to be a big company. Just be you and get them a really good product or service. Jason, is there one that sticks out as one of the strangest things that someone actually came up with in Souls? The strangest thing uh, and that they sell. Um, I, I already mentioned the uh, Tony's Monarch Butterfly uh, yeah. biz. I just never knew you. I couldn't imagine how you could monetize that. But as it happens, he started as a blogger. And his, and his story is that he started with that old blogging tool, um, um, site sell, which I don't know if you're familiar with. Mm, yes, yes. Ago, it was like a thing. And well, he started with their methodology. They have a very step by step methodology. And he started as a blogger. And then he monetized with advertising for a long time. Mm. I just Google, you know, ads. And then he got into e commerce. And that's when his, you know, we helped him mm. sort of sort out his Shopify and product strategies. And, and that's when things were, I mean, his thing has taken off for a long time, but he hit a new level with e-commerce. And so, you know, I mean, that's, when you think about that, you think, well, good grief, there's a lot of bugs in the world, you know? <laughs> I mean, there are, there are a lot of, there are a lot of angles. Some that, of them we don't want to save, the, some of them we don't want to save, but, but yes. I, I know, right? But there, but you, it unlocks the idea in terms of the thinking. Oh, totally. And the, uh, Someone was telling me about a YouTube channel I'd never heard of. You probably have heard of it. And they were, his name was Wild Coyote or something. Have you heard about this thing? Uh, no. um, I guess basically this guy captures things and gets bitten or stung by them. And that's the show. Oh and, he, and he talks about the background. So exactly what you're saying. This, I guess, is one of just it gets millions and millions of views. So like we have a, a lady who kind of started after we did on the YouTube side of things. This is an interesting story like that. Her, um, I interviewed her for my book, YouTube Marketing Power, mm-hmm. and um, her brand is called My Froggy Stuff. And all she did was made short videos making things for her daughter's Barbie doll out of like, you know, okay, here's, you know, it was almost like MacGyver level stuff. Like, okay, here's a bottle cap. And some glitter, and I'm gonna make you know this thing for the doll. But what she makes is actually like what? It really looks like the real stuff. And her at the time, we were like, this is cool. She's got some traction. She's kind of as big as we are on YouTube, and like you know, we like twenty thousand subscribers. So you know, that's not nothing. But yeah, like three million video views. Well, last time I looked, she had like 150 million video views. Wow. She had, I think she has over a million subscribers or some crazy thing. She. She's done deals now with Disney and Mattel, all the big companies, and it's just this simple idea. And so anyway, there's there's tons of stories like that. But back to your original question, it's all about finding a real need for a a group of people that you can identify and then serving them passionately uh, with content, with physical product if it makes sense, and being a hero, a, a champion for them and making them the hero, you know? Yeah, I think is the gist. Yeah, of it. I found this. It's called Brave Wilderness. They have like 12 million subscribers, and this guy's yeah. like getting stung by all these different things. Yeah, crazy. <laughs> um, so one of the biggest questions I'm sure the students ask, um, which I've heard you talk about, is traffic. Yeah. Right. Where do I do? Where do I get traffic? You yep. are. You have written obviously a bunch of books on. Um, and your your views and what you talk about on Pinterest, I found fascinating. Oh, sure. So, okay. yeah. talk yeah. about traffic for a second, and then we'll. I want to talk about. I know you have a book, um, yeah. Instagram book, Pinterest book, YouTube. Um, yeah. What do well, you tell context, people about traffic? Yeah. Yeah. As context, just so people know, and I not to brag or anything like that, but just as just to set the stage for the conversation. Uh, if you go to myip.ms and you look at um, the hosting company Shopify, because you can, because all the Shopify sites are hosted by Shopify servers. You can rank order them by worldwide site traffic, and as it happens, there's about 650,000 Shopify sites, and mm-hmm. mine is in. Depending on the day, it's it, you know it'll be in the top 500 to 2,000. Mm-hmm. Wow. And, and it, so so that's the volume of worldwide site traffic we have. So 
I do think, I mean, if that's my only credential, then there you go. But, um, so I'm passionate about traffic. Um, so yeah, Pinterest is of interest. So let me just start the conversation by saying, um, if you want to get traffic to your website, you have to know where, where traffic comes from around the internet. So that's the first question is where does all the traffic come from? Well, there's actually, if you look at, uh, specific sites that document these things, you can find the four top sources of traffic on the internet. Uh, and they are Google organic search, direct typing of the URL. So Google organic search, everybody knows that, what that is. So that's organic search and results pages. You get to that by having content on your site that Google's index and crawl that, you know, that they serve up. So, um, that's SEO, that's content. Um, you know, marketing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is direct typing of the URL into the browser. So I don't need to Google uh, bestbuy.com. I just, when I want to go there, I just open my Safari browser and type in bestbuy.com in the browser. So that's direct typing. So so that what does that mean? I call that, I, I think I've made this phrase up, but I call that branded browsing. Like I, I didn't know to go to rise25.com until I was introduced to you. And now if I thought about going back to your site, I would hit rise25.com. That's memorable. It's a, uh, you know, so you get that idea. So that's about your branding and getting your brand installed in customer's mind. Okay. So then the, that's hard to do, but that's branding work. The third one is Facebook. Facebook traditionally at the peak had about 26% of all internet traffic that it drove around the internet. That is declining massively and rapidly. Why is that? But because Facebook, well, a Pew Research study came out last month that said in the prior 12 months, 44% of 18 to 29 year olds had deleted the Facebook app from their phone. They don't use it. Yeah. They're I mean, my wife Facebook. says, you know, my wife's a child psychologist. She says no one, no kids are using Facebook at all. They're no, just over. using Instagram. That's it's over. It. Facebook is the equivalent and, and by the way, that Pew Research study, you can go look at it, but 26% of all participants in that poll had deleted the Facebook app from their phone in the prior 12 months in the U.S. That is a crater. And so what it means is Facebook is literally in the position, I don't, you, you know, you, we're probably about the same age. Um, Facebook is in the same position that the Yellow Pages was 15 years ago. That's hard to believe, right? Yeah, but it's true because... It was still around. It was still effective. Tons of company used it. It was still sort of known as a thing, um, but it was tired. It was old. It was just on the decline. Facebook is in that slot, whether you want to believe it or not. It's happening, man. And so, yeah. And so, but anyway, all that to say, on the on the order of who sends traffic where, Facebook is still in the third slot. And then the fourth one, uh, surprisingly, is Pinterest. Right. Which, if you look at the charts, um, and the best people who y you could look at for this kind of thing is, um, oh gosh, who who is it? Uh, Bitly has research on this, and then there's another site I'll remember in a minute because I'm old and I forgot it. But um, Shareaholic or something? Sh yes, Shareaholic. I only know that because you said this when oh, I was doing okay, my so research. See, I did yeah, not. See, I did not know that. You're quoting me, Jason. Yes, Miles says, is, that's, Look at that's a quote from you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but they say Pinterest, and if you look at the charts, it's mesmerizing because Pinterest is on this like slow but steady kind of not. It's not sexy at this point at all. It's just like this little, you know, quarter by quarter tiny, uh, you know, uptick. And meanwhile, Facebook, you can just see is like a mountain, you know, falling down the backside, and. Um, you know, the point at which, and, and so Pinterest has, I think last time I looked like six or 7% of all hmm. internet traffic. That which blew is my not, mind when you were talking yeah. about that, because I don't remember the last time I was on Pinterest. I know at all, but, and maybe it's going to, maybe it'll have its own, you know, decline. Yeah. But I'm not I saying that means anything. I'm just thinking yeah. that's like well, an untapped resource if people aren't yeah. using it. Yes, totally. I mean, if you're, listening to this and the thought of Facebook falling apart scares you and you're a business owner, I would say, and you've never looked into Pinterest seriously, I would say seriously look into Instagram and Pinterest, but Pinterest will drive traffic. Instagram will not do that. If you look at the charts, Instagram drives just a fractional amount mm. of traffic compared to Pinterest. But then the other one, of course, it's highly underutilized as well as LinkedIn for any B2B 
work or, or a business related consulting, coaching, that kind of thing. Um, but anyway, yeah, those are the top four sources of traffic. So if you don't have a battle plan for those four, it's like, what are you doing? Why, why would you spend a second on Twitter or YouTube if you don't have all four of those top ones on full lockdown? And so that's kind of my advice to people, and I get kind of passionate about it. But then I, you know, I have content. I'm like, hey, here's how you do marketing on Pinterest. Here's how you do, you know, Instagram, blah blah blah, like that. So. Yeah. Um, so if you haven't, if you've been like me, been on Pinterest in uh, whatever <laughs> seven years, you should probably look into it. I'm going to. Um, what's a couple things someone should be doing on Pinterest? Because I know when you talk about it. What's interesting about it is you say, you know, Pinterest wants you to refer out to other sites, whereas a lot of them kind of want to keep you in their ecosystem, right. which is kind of I mean, if you're selling products or selling something, yeah. you want to take them from Pinterest to your site. Um, what are some yeah. things people definitely need to be doing on Pinterest? Yeah, the first thing is to have your own website sorted out so that it's Pinterest friendly. And so that means you have uh, visual content on your site that is uh, that speaks to what you do. So, and this is obvious for physical product sellers. It's obvious for even digital goods sellers like our site, Pixie Fair. And, and you know, I mean, it, uh, we got lucky because we had good photography and Pinterest came along and it totally blew up our site traffic. And we were like, what in the world is this? Um, but other sites have just literally never figured it out. And it can be hard in some niches. Uh, don't deny that at all. But what you want to do is have your site be tuned up so that you've got a lot of images that, um, if nothing else, have graphics on them that say what you do, who you are, you know, like if you've got any kind of how-to content. You know, a lot of people will have blog articles that will have how-to content, like eight ways to do this. Well, they don't have a graphic that says eight ways to do, you know, they don't they don't mm. even have a graphic that supports the content. So you want to have visual representation of every content piece on your site, mm. either product or uh, content, you know, like for blogs and yeah. stuff. And that's a first step. And then you can fuel that fire by actually getting into Pinterest yourself and setting up a basic marketing plan, which is your own Pinterest account, your own boards. Then, you know, you start pinning stuff, um, you know, to your own boards and really starting to grind out sort of the basics of a Pinterest strategy. You can obviously use advertising in Pinterest now. Um, as well. I've got my original blog that I first got my book deal with, my original book deal, is still there, marketing on Pinterest.com. Hmm. Don't 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 make fun of me because of how ugly it is. But um I haven't blogged on that blog uh, site for probably four years, five years. But um in 2011 I got O C D about all of this and blogged about it and got a book deal with McGraw Hill. That's ultimately what kind of started my writing efforts so yeah so thank you thanks for actually just m making sure people are aware that yeah. it's out there because yeah. people are paying attention to facebook ads facebook you know youtube know, ads but... and no one's talking about i mean there probably are people but not in the people i've been talking to and they're not talking about pinterest no. at all um nope. and so there's two things i want to talk about one is instagram um, you have a yeah. book and you have one coming out or if someone's listening to this, maybe mm -hmm. it's already out. Um, and then talk about Instagram for a second. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, Instagram power was the book I wrote in 2013. It was published by McGraw Hill. Um, it was basically, so I got a book deal with McGraw Hill for Pinterest power and that book did well. And it, it and it did well enough that I was like, hey, I'm not dumb. Let me propose some new book ideas to these people. So I proposed uh, YouTube marketing power and Instagram power. And they said yes to both. They said like, hey, let's do both of these books. So um, so Instagram power I worked on. And it was really, it was our reflections on how are we going to use Instagram for our own business. And uh, so I wrote basically, a, I don't know anything about Instagram, but I'm learning. Here's my, here are my lessons. Here are my people I'm learning from. It was sort of I was a reporter in that book. And as it happens, it took off and it got translated in a uh, South Korean wow. language and, and it's in Nepal and Bangladesh and India and Australia and it's on the bookshelf still in Barnes and Nobles, you know, five years later. And so the new revised and expanded version is coming out in end of February, early March, 2019. And so um, that's sort of the story on the book. But I would say 
when I wrote that book, Instagram was sort of in the same category, like stratosphere wise. There was Facebook and then there was kind of like Pinterest, Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, you know, they were it's kind of right. all of the yeah. stepsisters, the unloved stepsisters. If you that see were still me looking cool. over here, by the way, I'm just looking at, I have your social media stuff up on oh, my sure. right okay. hand screen. Yeah. So it's not okay. that I'm not paying attention. I'm just looking at it because it's sure, fascinating sure, sure. with yeah. your YouTube and Instagram yeah. stuff. At yeah. Mr. Jason Miles yeah. is our, is my Instagram handle. And then you can see at Pixie Fair or at Liberty Jane Clothing on Instagram if you want to see how we do it for Cinnamon's yeah. work. And I mean, there's like how to cut out the t-shirt pattern liberty jangle there's seventy one thousand views on oh, you, on a youtube that. video on yeah. youtube yeah it's amazing yeah yeah yeah. so so we like this stuff and you know i mean so we've done different shenanigans over the years to figure it all out and so with instagram um when i wrote the book it was an also ran i but as it happens it has become this tour de force like crazy like the hot thing I mean, it's literally now it's like it's the hot thing. And so I'm super excited that the book's coming out in February, revised and expanded. And this time around with my work for this book, I literally just went to like these amazing people, Gary V and everybody. I mean, it's all the top people who are talking about Instagram. I just went and took their content and was like, hey, can I interview you or hey, can I include this? So it's just really the best of the Be best. Comprehensive. Of, yeah. And. And, and then the other piece that came out of that that I'm super like if you want to know kind of where my mind is at is I devoted two full chapters to influencer marketing mm. and I'm all about really figuring that mm. out for our own businesses now and I'm mm -hmm. super pumped about it um, it's it is the next new wave of crazy cool opportunity mm. for, for small business owners is it is it finished right now or are you still going to be adding to it the book is done okay. and it's in revision mode with Got McGraw it. Hill. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so anyway, Instagram in, in terms of strategy work, I can just tell you, I mean, I, if you want to get free resources from me, I'm happy to you know, mention those. Yeah. You have something um, that's five steps to 5k followers. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually literally just this morning, I'm putting the finishing touches on my freebie giveaway, uh, which is, uh, five steps to 5,000 Instagram followers. And they're not dumbly obvious, stupid things. I mean, it's I, I've tried to make some content that is actually not what you would, you know, this this will not be, you know, share a picture every day, stupidity level stuff. I, I've tried to make it nice for business owners so that they can really put their head around the idea. Mm -hmm. So that's um, I, that'll be done in the next, by the time people hear this podcast, that'll be out. You can find it on winningonshopify.com. Mm -hmm. um, it'll be free resource. Um, it was the genesis of that actually happened. I was at the growth conference a week ago, week and a half ago in Arizona. And my buddy, who's a multi-million dollar online seller, he does uh, um, insurance leads and resells them. He said to me when we were standing in line to go into the conference one morning, hey, I, I've ignored Instagram. What, what should I do? How do I do this? And I was like, okay, because he knew I wrote this book about it and, and I was focused on it. And so then he rattles off like these six or seven great questions. I was like, oh, crap. He's a smart guy. I really have to. So his questions are like, how do I integrate it into my sales funnel? Um, mm. How do I calculate ROI? Yeah, a little uh, higher level question that yeah, a business all the owner business, is going to ask. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. So I was like, Mike, can I write these down and include this in my free giveaway thing? So the his questions are the um origin story for this little giveaway but um anyway cool that's out there and available to people and then the book itself will be out we will also have um resources in the book we have a whole expansion pack um that we're gonna use the site we don't have set up yet but it'll be winning dot online for um the expansion pack and courses training on instagram it's not too late it is it is Instagram has been remarkable at adding business tools for, for small business owners and, and brand builders that we all need to know how to use. Hmm. So, I mean, it, it's, it's time for us to learn this stuff. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you one last question, but I'm asking you one question before the last question, because I need to ask, this is on my notes. I need to ask you because That's you two have questions. So, okay. It's exactly two. I'll just make, make it sound <laughs> like it's one, but it's actually two. Um, is contests. You have a lot of interesting yeah. ideas and opinions around contests because when we talk about traffic, um, yep. 
what's some yep. of the strategy people should be using around contests? I think it's underutilized also. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we started our business, in, as I mentioned, in 2008 with, you know, no list, no traffic, no anything and selling on eBay. But we we knew we needed to draw a crowd. And at the time we used YouTube and we started doing these design contests. And it totally worked. And um, then we, you know, then YouTube changed its algorithm. The, the tool we used inside YouTube, if people remember back in the day, was a respond to a video with a video feature. And they eliminated that um, years ago now. But we use that as a entry method for our contests. Mm. And so we just love contests. I mean, and that got us because it, it worked and it was a first thing. It just always put our mind in the mode of let's have contests. And so for 10 years, we've been trying different things and um, we're passionate about contests. Mm -hmm. uh, we do two a week nice. right now on Pixie Fair. And uh, we're in 2019, we're going to retire those two and replace them and then do three more. So we're going to end up doing five contests a week in our e-commerce uh, business. And, and let me mention why. So, so yeah. if somebody's listening to this, they're like, why contests? Okay, here's the big idea. Um, contests are what you might call a transcendent or a, a meta marketing strategy. So, and here's what I mean by that. Let's say you want to grow an Instagram account. Well, the fastest way you can do that is have a contest and the entry method, give away a good prize, and the entry method is follow me on Instagram. Well, so then you've just built an Instagram following and then you've got it so let's so now you've got an instagram following and if you don't have any you know you could talk about well how do you promote your contest and it's so easy but you basically you can set it up um use a site like wish pond and then just promote it on facebook or whatever but you, you get the idea so then you can use that first traction it's like a virtuous spiral you use the Instagram following you just had to promote your next contest, and you use that contest to grow your email list. Well, now you've got an email list <laughs> and an Instagram following, right. and you rinse and repeat. And so I'm a huge believer in weekly contests or monthly contests, and I teach it to all our students. I show them exactly how to do this. We have a free course, actually, a lot of content on this on winning on Shopify. And um, so that's the meta marketing strategy that's why it's so powerful it's because like if you tell me any traffic related goal i can show you how a contest fuels that and gets you it's like primes the pump and gets it really you know set up quickly and easily most people will just say you know oh you want to build an email list okay do advertising and most you know most marketers default especially the gurus their default go-to trick oh I'll, I'll help you fit with advertising well Advertising sucks a lot. You of could times. lose a lot of money very quickly. Yeah, exactly. And so I I break down the math when I do keynotes about this. I break down the math and I show people how inexpensive it is to get a customer acquisition strategy. You know, like an opt in, a following, you know, a social engagement. Um, and I break it down by the dollar amounts. I mean, it's literally pennies on the dollar. Um, and so, and you know, so contests are huge for that. And influencer marketing, by the way, is an, is another meta strategy, which is why I'm so pumped about it. It's like, if somebody wants to teach you like, oh, here's how you use Instagram ads. That is such a small tactical training. Fine. Of course you should learn that, but that's not big picture marketing. That's not something that's going to revolutionize you and you have ingrained in your mind as a new blueprint for success. Hmm. Influencer marketing and contests both are. And so that's why I always go on and on about them. I love them. Yeah. So, yeah. so mistakes in contests, you've run a lot of them. What are yeah. some of the, I yeah. don't know if that's to do with the prize or frequency yeah, sure. or whatever it is. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I think there are. You mentioned two right there that are decent mistakes. One is you do one contest and you're like, well, that didn't work that good. So I guess I'm never going to do that again. So it's really, it's smarter to say, hey, I'm going to do contests for three months every week and I'm going to learn how this works and then I'll quit it if it's not working. So, you know, you got to give it a good college try. But then a lot of the times people will screw up either with the prize, like they, they, you just have to think through like, what would your ideal prospect really really want yeah and is it attached in some way to what you're selling 
like that's the the line of thinking you got to go down is like how do i how do i get something that they'll like but they'll like me because i'm giving it to them mm. and then they'll want to buy what i have because i've you know got them on my list that that uh, yeah it's not something that, random like you know no, you have these car. patterns and you're like i'm going to give you an ipad like that doesn't really relate to exactly. your product yeah exactly and so then um so that's the the prize is a biggie to think through and then a lot of times people just err out on the technical tools a lot of the times the students we work with will be like my contest didn't get any signups and i'll like where's your contest link and i'll go to it and there's like there's no graphic they don't say what they're doing the entry methods are broken or they don't work. You know, like, okay, okay, you have to execute, you know, at a basic level right. of functionality for your, you know, prospect to yeah. know what in the world you're trying to do. And, yeah. you know, so. Yeah, I totally, like I was talking to someone and they said, I don't make any money with my website. I go to their website. I'm like, because you don't sell anything. Yeah, yeah. How, how are you going to make money if you don't yeah. sell anything in your site? Um, yeah. What were you saying about Wishpond? You mentioned something about uh, oh, sure. source Wishpond. Yeah. What is that? In our... Yeah, in our trainings we do. Again, you know, you, there's I have a whole set of free videos you can watch on winning on Shopify.com, but one of them is a list of uh, the contest tools that mm. we like and we use. Wishpond is one. Rafflecopter is another one that we use all the time. Um, there are a whole bunch. Viper. It just depends on what you want to do. But some of them, here's the main, the main line of difference. Some of them have a landing page built into their tool. So you don't have to have your own website. And then some of them are made to be embedded in your website. And so, you know, depending on whether you have your own Shopify or so, or site or not, um, you'll choose a different tool. But Wishpond is one a lot of people like. And Yeah. Yeah. So. First of all, Jason, this has been absolutely fantastic. I want to be the first one to thank you. Um, even though I said I have one last question, and that was like 30 questions ago. Oh. Um, but well, well, did we cover it? Though? Everyone, I mean, you, yes. Your last... <laughs> no, we didn't. But, but no, bring um, it on, dude. Unless you're out of time. No, but, uh, but um, I want to point people towards a couple of your sites first. Sure. So everyone should check out winningonshopify.com. Yep. Um, sh everyone should check out pixiefair.com. It's p-i-x-i-e-f-a-i-r-e.com. Um, yep. I mean, the site's beautiful. You could just see the layout and what you guys have built is an amazing marketplace. So congratulations on that. Um, my last question um, is about the nonprofit. I just want you to talk a little bit about that sure. because that, yeah. I mean, you've been doing that for 30 years. Um, but yeah. before I, but is there anything else on the winning on Shopify.com that we should point out before I want you to talk about the nonprofit? No, I mean, I, and it's obviously self-explanatory. Just go okay. check it out. If you're into into my trainings or following me or whatever, feel free to you know connect. I do all the programs and coaching stuff is available mm -hmm. there. Yeah. The nonprofit work is yeah. something that, um, I mean, I've dedicated my whole life to, to nonprofit. I, my graduate degree is an MBA with an emphasis in international nonprofit management, and it's just been my whole career. In our specific case for the charity that we run, I was – in uh, Zambia, which is a country in southern Africa area, and in the capital city of Lusaka. And we had a down day in our schedule. This was when I worked for a different charity. And the person said, well, we don't have anything today, but we really like this local school. It's in this really desperate slum. And we don't fund them with money, but when we can, we give them some products. And we have some blankets we were going to take to them today. If you wanted to go with us, you could. And I was like, sure, of course. So first of all, the place is called Nome Bay Compound is um, catastrophe. Hmm. I mean, it's what to do you go mean? there. Yeah, it's hard to, for me to, to picture. To go there. Well, envision, um, first of all, envision 150,000 people. Half of them are under 15. Mm. And inside an area that's just a few, you know, a very small area, all dirt roads, all shanty little buildings. Um, and um, it's a disaster. The They're all kids because most of the middle aged adults have all died of HIV, AIDS, TB or malaria, mostly HIV, AIDS. I mean, the AIDS pandemic destroyed that 
country. And the way it works in a country like that is like 13 million people. But like you say, at like at the 13 million person level, let's say 13% have HIV. But then if you go to the capital city, it goes up a lot. Then if you go into this slum area, the percentage is staggering. So, so, and it's just a, just a very hard place to, to go. And, and, um, so generally speaking, like they, what the phrase is, is very, very few Mazungus, white people, ever go into. I was going to say, you probably stick out a bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, in fact, I've had career missionaries who were in Zambia for 30 years say to me, we've never gone into Nombe compound. Mm. And I just, so anyway, so we go in and we, we meet with this teacher lady. Her name's Esther. She's got 475 kids in a partially completed church building and it is chaos i mean it is literally like there's first grade over in this corner second grade over in that corner it's all just moms teaching these kids the moms are are marginally literate and most most of the adults in the community are, are not they don't read and write they're not literate um and so, but they sang for us, they danced for us, they made me dance <laughs> for them. And um, so here's the critical moment which started our charity. Uh, and half the kids are HIV positive. Wow. And two thirds of the kids are orphans and they live with their aunties or their grandmas. And uh, so the critical moment was we did the song and dance portion of the program and then they we break up the kids are in their classes and we walk over and they introduce us to the moms of the school and the moms of the school have made costume jewelry like out of you know like just the plastic beads like the and they're hanging on nails on this cinder block wall and they say the moms are trying to raise money so that one day we'll have our own school hmm and and we look at the costume jewelry and there were a few of us in our group and in between uh, you know between us we just said let's buy all the jewelry <laughs> let's buy it all so you know we said to esther how much are these a piece i'm like oh you know a dollar a piece whatever so we we said we'll take all of it so it's like 70 dollars. they start dancing and doing like this African and and I just broke and uh, it was this this moment of clarity in my life where and I, and I could go into why but my own backstory and stuff but, yeah why um, well to be blunt is because my mom raised us as a single mom my dad took off when, when I was nine Hmm. without a trace he just disappeared and i remember my mom struggling so much i remember my mom figuring out how to find a job and and you know when you're nine years old you're just like i just wanted to help her right so i'm standing there i'm seeing these moms in this you know it hit deep for you it just it yeah. was just like i'm i'm one of these kids hmm. this is one of my mom this is my mom yeah and and I'm sitting there thinking, oh, I, I got to do something about this. I don't know what. So I just said to that lady after the program, hey, uh, do you have any donors that help you? No. Any local donors from, from Lusaka? No. And no none, none from America or Canada? No. I said, well, do you have email? She said, yeah, I have an email. And I said, could I email you? And but she so, has an email. Yeah. Yeah. So she had electricity. I mean, you know, it's, it's interesting. And now she has a smartphone. Dude, she's sending me photos, <laughs> videos from now we have. OK, so fast forward to today. We have a, a sewing cooperative that employs 20 moms with great wages and they make reusable feminine hygiene pads and school uniforms. And we have a soap cooperative and it employs four people. And we're really growing that right now. That's our focus. And they make soap and sell it locally and give it to the kids in the school. And then we have a 10 acre farm and that employs people and they make food for the kids for lunches. And, but anyway, so her and I worked that out. And over the last 10 years, we've just grown and grown and grown. So powerful.org is the, Hmm. 
mm. charity and it's a passion of ours and are we the the kernel of the idea is creating jobs for the moms and dads of that community that create ac- that empower academic success by what they do so the school uniforms was our first program and that empowered the academic success of the kids they ended up getting a beautiful school building a miracle happened um and now they've got a beautiful school and sewing cooperative, soap cooperative, a farm. And uh, 10 years later, I look back and I say, this is the most meaningful thing I've ever done. Hmm. It will be our legacy. And as long as we're, as long as we're around, we're going to be figuring out how to help moms in Zambia and, and beyond maybe one day, um, you know, help improve the lives of their kids. And uh, so that's our passion. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. That's remarkable. Yeah. Um, so are there videos of this or anything like that that we can put on the post maybe? Sure, um, sure of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For soulpowerful.org. Soul and we've got a, in the resources section, we've got videos. Mm. Um, you can check us out, of course, on Facebook. There's a lot of content on Facebook. You will see uh, a ton of beautiful purses being made. Hmm. One of the ways in which we got donors involved was in 2014, we made this program called the So Powerful Purse hmm. program, where we basically have, and this is, sorry to weave it all, maybe this will weave it all together, I don't know, but basically we went to all of our e-commerce customers and we said, would you do us a favor? Would you make a purse hmm. for a girl in Africa? And um, it, we didn't know if they would, but it totally turned into this program where the seamstresses from nine countries around the world right now make these purses. Hmm. They get shipped to Zambia. The seamstresses in Lusaka make reusable hygiene pad and pads, and then they also make soap. And it's all put together, and it's given to girls in health class. And the girls take a pledge to stay in school all month, even on their period, if they get a purse, because their tradition is they stay home from school when they're on their period because they don't have any product. Hmm. And so this solves that problem. It gives girls back on average six weeks of school a year Hmm. and it creates jobs along the way. And so, yeah, so that's, you can check all that out on sopowerful.org. And if you're into that kind of thing or you want to learn more about it, for sure, check us out. And yes, yeah, our our overhead rate last year, by the way, was 1.35% because basically what we do is, Cinnamon and I pay all the bills out of our e-commerce company. Hmm. And all the donors on the So Powerful side know that. They know that we're the the sort of, I guess what you might call, anchor donor. And so that's how it all weaves together. And so we've kind of woven it together into our e-commerce mission. And so our our customers on the e-commerce side like us because what they know we do that. And the donors on the charity side think we're cool on that side because we're e-commerce people and we're using our business for good. Hmm. So, yeah. Everyone check out, it's sewsopowerful.org. Jason, thank you. It puts things in perspective in life in general, right? No doubt. When you hear that, I mean, I'm just hearing it and you actually experienced it, you know, firsthand, so... Yeah. It's, uh, well, thank you, man. I really, really appreciate the chance to share all my crazy stories and and uh, experiences. Um, by the way, total side note, um, Rise 25, I totally want to check out because I need to learn more from you on all of that stuff. And actually, your content on your site and your promo f- before the podcast both caught my attention. Cool. And I totally want to learn more about that. So awesome. we'll have to connect. Yeah, We will connect. And when you're in Chicago, we'll connect too. So Awesome. Thanks, Jason. Really appreciate it. Yep, happy to be. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.